Hello and welcome to another Debating Europe expert panel with me, Joe Lidabarski. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Debating Europe and I am here in Brussels with a panel to discuss the future of data privacy, engineering and invention in the world of data protection. Uh, we're going to respond to some questions that you've sent us in on our website, debatingeurope.eu. Uh, we're going to spend the next half an hour talking um, about the current, dis you know, where's, what is the state of play on uh, the discussions around data privacy today? Um, and then we'll push things out a little bit more speculatively into the into the future and try to kind of anticipate some of the, the technological challenges that might be coming down the pipeline. So I'm very excited to be joined here today by Jana Tum, who's an Estonian MEP uh, and sits with the Liberal Renew Europe um, group in the European Parliament. Hello, Jana. Hello. Um, next to her is Keith Enright, who is Chief Privacy Officer at Google. Hi, Keith. Hello. Um, and next to Keith is uh, Natasha Gerlach, who's uh, Director of Privacy Policy at the Center for Information Policy Leadership. Hello, Natasha. Hello. Um, and last but not least, we have um, uh, Jean-Claudio uh, Jean uh, Malgieri, who's Associate Professor of Law at Leiden University and is co-director of the Brussels Privacy Hub. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Good. Thank you all for being uh, with me today. So we have a set of questions sent in from, from readers. I'm going to start off with the, the first one, and this is really about where you think the debate is today. Okay, so what's the, the current state of play? It's sent in from Hunker, who says, I think that most young people now are more aware about digital privacy. Uh, so the question then is, I'll start with, with Jana and then I'll, I'll go down the, the panel perhaps. The question is, she sounds quite optimistic. She sounds like, um, okay, progress from her perspective has been made. Uh, there's, uh, the issue is, is really higher up the policy agenda than it was in the past. Uh, people kind of care about this. Um, what's your sense, Jana, about where the debate is today? Uh, do you share that kind of sense of optimism? Uh, yes, absolutely. I do share it, but uh, not completely, I would say that you can be aware, but this doesn't mean that uh, you really understand how serious is this. I mean, uh, when I was thinking of this debate, trying to switch from previous one on a different topic, I thought, oh my God, I use Uber, I use all kinds of food delivery. I mean, these people know everything about me. They know where do I live, where my parents live, where my boyfriend lives, what do we eat, what kind of underwear we prefer. I mean, basically everything. But this is very unpleasant knowledge. And I don't want to, to fix on that, you know. I know that and I try to forget it. And I believe that if you are, I don't know, let's say teenager, you may be aware, but you, you have different understanding of what is sensitive. Uh, so m you know that you shouldn't um, say yes to every cookie. Mm. But does this mean that you really don't say yes to every cookie? I believe that uh, and in these terms, legislation is, of course, very important, but I believe that at least the same importance is for education. Okay, so maybe this greater awareness doesn't necessarily translate into kind of changing behavior, yeah. changing... Yeah. Absolutely, and vice versa. I mean, uh, uh, older people, maybe they understand it better, but their digital skill is not that good. Okay. So uh, we are not in the balance yet. Okay. Keith, what about you? What, what, what do you see as the, the kind of the discussion now, the kind of state of play? So, I mean, I would agree with what's been said. I actually wouldn't limit it to just young people. I think all of us are becoming more sophisticated in the way we're thinking about privacy um, and in the values that are at play when we make decisions about privacy. I also agree we've got a ton of work to do. Um, part of what is driving a lot of this is so much more of our lives are being um, intermediated by technology. As a result, we're producing more data. Um, there are lots of services that are out there that are trying to add value, <laughs> make people's lives better. Um, we at Google, we want to help make people more useful, more productive. We want to keep them safe when they're online. A lot of that service delivery involves processing data. Uh, and the challenge that's ahead is making sure that we're doing that in a way that users understand they're comfortable with and that they're pleased with the value exchange that's taking place. Okay, so I'm going to characterize both of your positions as kind of cautious optimism. You know, it's a bit, it's balanced. Uh, Natasha, what about you? Where, where do you sit on this? Yeah, so um, I'm German, and so we have some of the oldest um, data protection laws, uh, and, and so... Uh, you know, I would disagree a little bit with we are now more aware. I think it's, it might also be, uh, it's a very general um, statement um, and there may be cultural differences as well. I think where I would agree is that uh, young people certainly um, are far more tech savvy. They are um, much quicker in adopting technology, but um, also the younger generations are 
much more willing to ask about their rights and uh, to um, you know to to question how this works and um, you know all of us are, are privacy specialists and so uh, but we are not the average consumer but I do see that there is a lot more activism um, amongst young people asking uh, about what's happening to my data and and I think this debate is is a testament to that as well and so um, what is important in that is I think that digital trust matters and that uh, you know it's incumbent on on uh, on companies but then also on regulators etc to to create an environment where that is fostered you know to, where we can we are transparent about what's happened where you can answer uh, and ask and uh, get your questions answered so I think um, that's to me a bit where this moves toward creating um, digital trust because technology happens and technology mm. is going to stay and as Keith was saying it's embedded in all of our lives and it will be more and more so in the future. And, and do you think, I mean first of all I think it's interesting you said at the beginning uh, you know I'm from Germany and it's perhaps seen it a little bit differently there so do you think in, in, so I mean it was a very very general statement and I think what's interesting is to unpack it a bit because it does feel like Germany's a bit ahead of where other countries are perhaps. Um, uh, so, so do you think in, in Germany you have that kind of environment that you were talking about where uh, you, know, you can engage with these, these questions, you know, ask, asking questions, or do you think there's still more work to be done? And do you think that um, Germany is the kind of model to be followed? Um, so I don't think Germany is that different in terms of how it is for the rest of Europe. I mean, we do have the, the general data protection regulation, which, uh, which is applicable across, although there are jokes that it's actually the German data protection regulation, because many of the concepts that we see were in existence before in German data protection law as well, and they have been adopted. Um, so I think it, the same work has to be done there. I think that people have always been um, quite um, adamant about asking about their privacy and they were quite concerned about their um, their privacy and so um, that's perhaps the difference, right? We had one of the earliest um, privacy laws when um, uh, uh, cameras became mobile, right? Mm -hmm. So that's where, where this started because you could start to take pictures of people in pri doing private activities and then publish it in the newspapers. So, you know, we had a very early law about that. And so it's just a sort of an, an understanding of, of privacy and then, then following that through. Um, that is perhaps what I meant by it, you know, we are, um, and you know, uh, other people say we complain a lot, but we do definitely <laughs> raise questions about our, our yes. data protection. Okay. Uh, John Claudio, uh, what about you? How would you characterize the kind of state of the debate at the moment? Yeah, I mean, I kind of, of agree with, uh, um, let's say, more awareness in younger generation, but maybe we don't all agree of the effects of this because uh, I think there is higher awareness but um, uh, less risk adversity of younger generations. So basically there's different long-term risk acceptance. They know that their data are monetized but they accept it. Um, and they accept to be in this uh, marketplace of information which might bring to different results in the future. Um, I think that um, it's important to look at uh, uh, the safeguards that, uh, um, that younger generation maybe sometimes don't take. Um, we, did, we had the opportunity to, to do long research on vulnerable people in data protection. At the Brussels Privacy Hub, uh, together with Future Privacy Forum, we just launched uh, a few days ago the uh, Vulnera. It's an international observatory on vulnerable people in data protection. And we noticed that there, there is this, uh, this uh, a paradox, we can say. Um, so uh, older generations might have digital divide, but more risk adversity for technology. And the opposite is for younger generation. Um, the point is that vulnerability um, is uh, twofold. We have uh, decisional vulnerability, so data subjects that are not capable to either understand risks or understanding their rights. Uh, and then there is the other kind of vulnerability, which is vulnerable to the effects of data processing. For example, children might be manipulated, uh, vulnerable consumers might be manipulated or misled, and there are vulnerable groups. So yes, of course, the discussion is very very, very intense and I think we will, it's a point that we will discuss long. Yes, oh and in fact um, uh, uh, this actually links really nicely to the next question. I'll, I'll come to you Nat Natasha, I see you, your hand up, but um, so you know the, we start from the perspective of the consumer but of course the consumer is one part of this, there's regulation, there's you know industry, there's and this is really what the, the next question kind of uh, moves on to which is uh, from Rita who says technology by itself is nothing more than a tool 
Tools cannot be categorized as good or evil. It will depend on how these tools are used and by whom. It's important to ensure that these tools are only put on the market after appropriate, appropriate safeguards have been tested to ensure that users' privacy is protected, which is the point that you were making, uh, John Claudio. It's also important to enable end users to be aware of risks and benefits. Um, so, Natasha, uh, I'm gonna, uh, you can, I know that you maybe wanted to respond to, to what uh, uh, Jean Claudio was saying, but um, perhaps you could, you know, finish your, your your response to him. But then also, what would you say to Rita? And sure, I, I just wanted to um, maybe uh, you know question this slightly to say that um, the paradox is perhaps not necessarily that um, they are that the younger people are um, less uh, risk averse, but also that they don't have time. <laughs> and they're, not, they're just simply not willing to read 15 pages of, of privacy notices mm. to understand what's happening. So I think there is um, a lot of room uh, to create tools that help them make uh, informed decisions without having to do this. And so technology, I think, is, is a great enabler for that. And, and there are um, you know, some uh, 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 projects in the works to try and work out um, how this can be done. And I think children, for instance, for that is an excellent example because um, in order to process children's data, you have to figure out how to get the information um, to them uh, age appropriately uh, and to their parents. And so you have to find ways to do this interactively. And I don't see why the same ideas mm. could not be used for doing it also to older, you know, uh, teens and then, you know, younger generations, but also people like me older generations to say, I understand that you have very little time, but you need to still understand what's happening to your data. And I want to tell you about it, but in a way that uh, makes it easier for you to then be empowered to say, I use this, but I don't use that yes. uh, as an example. Which, which is sort of Rita's point, you know, how do we build privacy into the yeah. tools rather than putting the burden on, on the consumer? How do you kind of design exactly. it from a privacy uh, I have, perspective? Yeah. So, <clears throat> One, so John, uh, John Claudio and I just were in fact just at the Global Privacy Assembly and, and there were a number of um, uh, events around privacy enhancing technologies, which is a, effectively a way um, to try and, and move the discussion to the front of the line. How can I um, minimize the data? How can I safeguard the data in advance so that I don't need to use all this data or that I don't need to use it in that this or I don't need to centralize it all? And so there, for instance, at SIPL, we are doing uh, a project on that to try and A, work out you know, what these technologies are, what they are good for, what they're not good for. They're not the silver bullet, obviously, mm. but that is something, um, you know, that um, companies are also uh, moving towards and developing in order to safeguard privacy. And I, one statement that, that Rita made, I agree very much with, is that technology isn't good or bad. Yes. Technology just is, and it's the use that is in question. So, yes. you know, that is what we need to safeguard on how we are using the data after it was collected, because collection will simply happen. We yes. are all generating data all the time. Well, well let's, so. let's ask someone from uh, a technology company, uh, Keith, uh, what's, well, you know, what, what, what is, <laughs> how is Google approaching this? You know, when, you, when we think about um, building privacy into kind of technology, you know, what, what, what's Google's approach? Sure, so I think it's helpful to start from the perspective of recognizing and appreciating the value that technology is delivering in people's lives today, right? I mean, it was not terribly long ago that our founders set out with this ambitious mission to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. It's easy now to just take for granted the fact that every one of us with a mobile device has access to all of the world's knowledge. Um, that kind of forward motion in technology, as you say, it's not slowing down, um, it's only accelerating. That creates an awesome responsibility on all of us, whether it be the people who are designing buildings building and deploying technology, regulators who are trying to protect the interests of the public, um, civil society who's trying to make sure that sort of there are thoughtful people informing this whole process. Um, each of us has, I think, an important role to play in this. For us, we want to make sure that we are using our technical expertise and our ability to create new and innovative technologies, not only to deliver the kind of value that you see in search or Gmail, but also to deploy technologies that will actually help mitigate the potential risks um, that data collection could create. Privacy enhancing technologies are a huge area of opportunity here, and we've really tried to lead industry with things like differential privacy, federated learning, trying to do more, enabling that forward motion of technology and all the value that people are realizing 
saying, well, minimizing the amount of data we're collecting or minimizing the amount of information that you have to share with us or any other service provider in order to realize the benefit of the service. So we are continuing to innovate in that space. We'll continue doing that work and then working closely with regulators and policymakers because we actually think that regulation is required in many of these areas. We, we don't necessarily believe that technologists should be trusted entirely to themselves to just go and deploy and hope for the best. We actually think there's a very important role that policymakers, lawmakers, and regula regulators have in this space, hopefully to have a balanced approach, smart regulation that allows for data-driven innovation and gives us and others very clear rules of the road so that we know the parameters within which we should be operating and the democratic societies around the world are putting appropriate controls on technology while still allowing us to do our very best to solve some of the hard problems facing the world today. I love how each panelist is segueing so nicely to the next panelist. This makes my job much easier. Jana, because we're talking about policymakers and you know the role that um, uh, regulators can, can play in this. And when I look at Rita's comment, you know, it's clear she says, um, uh, you know, there need to be appropriate safeguards in place. It's important to enable end users to be aware of, of risks and, and, and benefits. You know, there's a clear role for, or it seems to me anyway, for regulation in this. Uh, you know, what kind of uh, trends in, you know, or rather, how, how do you think policymakers can support this process of building privacy into, into technology without, you know, um, I suppose, uh, harming innovation or kind of uh, closing down kind of uh, possibilities? Uh, you know, if it comes to geography, I have to say that I'm coming from Estonia. And like I uh, used to say everywhere, you know, we can do absolutely everything in the digital world, starting from registration birth and uh, ending by uh, booking place in the cemetery and absolutely everything in between. I mean, you can sell your apartments sitting in the, I don't know, in the beach and the palm, in the internet, you can go to court, absolutely everything. But when I, when I speak to politicians and when I speak to technological experts, I have a feeling that we are coming from different planets. Natasha is from Germany. Uh, you have to run to European Parliament. For if I speak to German <laughs> colleagues, to German MEPs, you know, uh, digital skill is, I would say, two out of ten, a digital, digital um, uh, trust. People just don't believe in these things, you know, and the, this is this is very, very important thing. You have to build trust. Yes. And of course, we are working on all this AI Act, Data Governance, Digital Services Act, million of things, you know, trying to regulate, to minimize, to build in all these protection things. But people still prefer signature on the paper and preferably by blue pen, not black. <laughs> and you know, I, I'm not kidding, you know, even in the European Parliament, if I make a signature by black pen, they will not accept the paper. You know, uh, which is that we are speaking and we are just in a different place now, you know. Mm. But policy making, and it requires kind of broad consensus. Yes. But you will know very well that, you know, all these things can be misused. And you mentioned democratic governments, but, uh, you know, Unfortunately, we have some not very democratic governments even inside the EU. And people are really scared that they are kind of, you know, big brothers watching me. But this and this is a problem, of course. But isn't there a problem here in, because if the, as I understand what you're saying, that the, the kind of, the, there's a difference in terms of, of digital skills or in terms of kind of be how kind of um, comfortable you are with, with these kind of new technologies. And yet, uh, if the European Parliament and national parliaments have to uh, regulate this. It's not only about being comfortable with yes. new technologies. I mean, if we, if we uh, call internet new technology, I don't know. Do we call internet new technology? Uh, I, uh, it's uh, pretty if, established. If yeah. not, you know, we just spoke before the beginning yeah. of the event that in every fourth Italian school, there is no internet connection. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We know course in Germany, there is no internet in the building, you know. And now we are trying to, sorry, and now we are trying to tell them that, hey guys, you can basically go, go to court from home yes. via Zoom and yeah. say, what Zoom? We don't have internet at all. So, I mean, we are in, in, in very different very different levels. Yes. But still, uh, I believe that the, this was the question in the very beginning, but I will try to now to, to wrap it out now, you know. Yes. What is the end of the, of the way? I believe it has to be kind of opportunity for a person to make conscious choice about his data without affecting his access to any kind of service. Yes. Or if we have somebody who wants to live without internet, without, I don't know, digital tools, whatever, he has to, to, to be provided the same opportunities, which is, of course, a huge challenge. But we cannot force people to accept it. Yep. I would like to, but we cannot do that. Yeah.
Uh, Keith and, and then uh, John Claudio. Sure, just one thing to say, and this may surprise some people to be coming from me of all the people on the panel, but I think there's room for optimism here, candidly, in that a huge part of my role has been engaging with regulators, lawmakers, policymakers around the world. I've been doing it for over 20 years, and I had a number of meetings with members of the European Parliament just this week. I am consistently impressed by the level of technical sophistication that I'm seeing. There could be a bias based on the people that I'm meeting with. Um, it could be the fact that they're willing to take a meeting with me is evidence. You know. <laughs> <laughs> it's evidence of the fact that they're sort of dialed in on these issues and they're thinking about this. But I will say, sort of, it wasn't always that way here or anywhere else in the world that I've met. I, I, I presumed a lack of technical, a lack of technical sophistication when I went in and met with partly because this wasn't their job, like this was my job, and technology was a thing that they were thinking about for a small portion of their day. I'm seeing that change, and I, for one, I'm, I'm encouraged. I would much rather be engaging with policymakers that have a deep technical understanding mm. of the forces that they're trying to regulate, and I see a lot of positive movement there. So I, I don't, I, I recognize the problem that you're yeah. talking about. I think it's very real. I think no, yeah. I'm also optimist, but you know, we, we yeah. are all different. Understood. Well, I, I'm reminded of the, I think it's a quote from William Gibson who says, the future's already here, it's just unevenly distributed, which I think is... Uh, that quote is written on the wall of our <laughs> Singapore office, oh, Really? Ah, okay. <laughs> uh, John Claudio. Yeah, I think something is emerging in this discussion, and is that Technology, in a way, created the privacy problem, but now technology is, in a way, proposing to solve the problem. And uh, uh, Kit was mentioning differential privacy. Uh, um, we have federated learning that can replace uh, the problem of cookies, right? So technology might be a solution also uh, to the, the problem. Maybe we should not forget that um, uh, privacy is a bigger concept. It's not just minimizing the data. Privacy is also protecting fundamental rights in general in the digital world. And I think that even the, this by design approach that we have with differential privacy, we have with synthetic data, etc., cetera, um, is looking at the technical side of the by design approach, but not at the organizational one. So we need fairness in, in, the, in, the, in the business management, not just technology that can solve all the problem. Because even if we use federated learning, we could manipulate consumers. So we need to look at the two sides. Technology is a solution, but then we need good business models that take into account the well-being of the consumer. And I think Rita's uh, point was really uh, uh, leading to that. That technology is a problem, is a solution, but men, people, humans are solutions and problems, I think, yeah. This is a really interesting point. I want to, I want to, I'm conscious of the time, so I want to, and this is a really rich discussion, but I want to move forwards a little bit um, to the the kind of, I, Jana, you, you kind of mentioned this end game question, which I think is really, really key. Um, so I'm going to bring in maybe the, the next two questions from, from readers back to back, because I think they're quite similar in a sense. So the next question, I think, is from Corrado, who uh, asks whether the Internet of Things could be abused by authoritarian governments. Uh, what is the Internet of Things? And in the future, is my fridge going to be spying on me? I think that's a, that's a, a, a good question. Uh, and then Tomash, the, the, the final question that we've also had, I think it's along a similar line. So Tomash, and this was in a focus group that, that I was moderating actually, and Tomash, kind of an online focus group, he said, I'm worried about what our data might be used for beyond just advertising. For example, there are companies out there that want to design an AI that tries to guess people's sexuality. What if Iran or somewhere where homosexuality Sexuality is illegal, gets hold of an AI like that, our data can be used to discriminate, and what if that data is sold to malicious entities? So they're kind of sketching out future threats, future things to kind of be aware of, uh, and, and in some cases it's not that futuristic, you know, it's not so so speculative. So maybe I'll, I'll kind of, the question I want to put to you is, you know, it's sort of the question of the debate, what kind of future do we want to live in? What is the kind of end game when it comes to data privacy? Now, now I, I sometimes draw the link with, I think I did earlier in the debate, uh, environmental protection. I have a clear sense of what the end game is there. We want a sustainable environment that we can, we can live in and isn't going to degrade over time. What is the end game when it comes to privacy? Is there an end game or is it just constantly being vigilant, constantly kind of holding to these values and, and seeing opportunities to use technology to kind of protect um, the, those, those values. So maybe I'll go down the, the panel again. We've got about five minutes left, so I think enough time just to have a, a short discussion on this. So, so Jana, what do you see? We're getting a bit speculative here. I, I, I appreciate that. But what do you see as the kind of you know, future of, of, of data privacy? You know, I, uh, when I was thinking about this Internet of Things, I just called my son on another business. He's 17, 
and ask, but does he think about it? He says, okay, I don't want this vacuum cleaner to tell you how many pair of dirty socks did it find under my bed. <laughs> I mean, this is kind of, you know, this is a joke, but everything which can be hacked can be misused, and including fridge, I don't know, whatever, heating, device, whatever else. But, you know, uh, then we just have to make a choice, you know, if we want to have these technologies, and probably we do, then we just have to educate people really, uh, have I would say heavily, I don't know if I can say in English, to heavily educate somebody, but this is really, I believe, mean, this is crucial. And of course we need legislation, but this legislation has to be kind of, uh, I mean, opened, for nobody knows what will happen tomorrow in technology. And we have the problem uh, that legislation is constantly lagging behind, for you know, you are much faster guys than we. When we are trying to regulate something, when we see, ah, we didn't think about that or this thing. But what can be the, uh, the end, really, I, at the moment, I, I really don't have another answer that if you don't want to share your data with somebody, just don't go online. But this is not doable, probably. Mm. So the safeguards in place and uh, uh, people aware of what's going on, and of course, democracy. Mm. For, you know, uh, look what's going on in China. Yeah. And it's, yeah. No, it's amazing, you know, it's, social uh, profiling, whatever, you know, it's absolutely amazing. And this is even worse. And if you if you come to chi China, the first thing you do in the airport, you leave your fingerprint there. Yeah. And if you don't want it, you have to go back. You know, this is. Uh, Keith, what is the kind of privacy end game from your perspective? So I think to talk about the privacy end game, you have to talk about just the future more abstractly. Right. I want to be sensitive to time here. But. You mentioned AIML. There was a question about AIML. Um, the potential for artificial intelligence and machine learning to make unprecedented advances in improving the human condition is astonishing. We're incredibly excited about it as a company. I think we are on the cusp of realizing just truly incredible things that are going to make people's lives better. Um, that said, people do get concerned whenever we see sort of a radical shift, a disruptive or tectonic moment in technology, we want to be cognizant of the potential downside so we're not blinded by our optimism, so we're not behaving responsibly. Um, when I think about ultra large data sets, when I think about the processing of large volumes of data, and as you've said, more and more devices coming online, the internet of things, more things becoming network connected or network aware, that is going to create challenges for us. One that I think we will all be collectively grappling with is, how do we empower users? How can we guarantee that we are collecting, processing, using information in ways that users understand and are comfortable with? And how do we do that in a way that doesn't destroy their experience of technology? It's very tempting to just ask for permission in the moment for every single thing that every single user wants to do with every single piece of technology they interact with. That will break the world as we know it, and then we'll never realize those incredible benefits. So we have a very hard problem to collectively come together and solve. How do we empower users in that way while still delivering on this incredible promise that technology is holding right in front of us as a carrot. If I had the solution to that, I would not be having my time with this panel here. Right now. I would be actively working with engineers to build up, but we're thinking about it. And I do think collectively, one of the reasons I'm a techno optimist is I see policymakers, technologists, I see civil society. I think we are zeroing in on it. You know, I don't necessarily agree with everybody that's in the conversation, but I see a tremendous amount of sincere high octane kind of mental horsepower leaning in to trying to help us figure out how to unlock all of that value that technology has to deliver, but do it in a way that's actually protecting people from the potential downsides. Okay, Natasha, same question to you. We've got like about uh, a minute each, so just Yeah, to... so I, I do agree with both of you. So with Jana's point, I think we do need um, uh, uh, out, you know, we need nimble uh, 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 laws that are able to adapt to technology because uh, it's developing very quickly, as you say, and there, there are, um, there's technology out there that, you know, it will be there in, in six months maybe that we haven't conceived of yet. And so we need to have um, principle-based rules uh, that are able to adapt to that, where we define an outcome, we have sufficient uh, 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 guidance from regulators on what is acceptable and what is not acceptable, and that will require dialogue between the stakeholders to define what we find uh, acceptable. We have to, uh, for regulators, they have to incentivize companies to be accountable, to demonstrate I have done my risk assessments, I have done X, Y, Z to protect the rights of the users, to build in what Jean-Claudia was saying, you know, 
the human rights effect here. I have done all of this, and here is what we are doing with it. Because in the end, I think you're quite right, Keith. It's about empowering the user to understand and to be able to make informed choices. It's about education, uh, and it's about transparency. Um, and this is an iterative process. There is no end game, right? It's, it will continuously evolve, and we see this um, uh, going also into... Um, uh, you know, ESG uh, considerations mm. at board level, for instance. This is a big topic and, and we need to continue working on it. Maybe one word uh, summarizing and going on. It's dynamic, yes. The end game is dynamic, but there is one word, which is dignity. Maybe that is the end game. Mm. Dignity is both autonomy of people, but also basic protection of people. And sustainability is a dynamic concept. Dignity is a dynamic concept. Super difficult to address for, for, for legal scholars, for, for, for lawyers, for, for politicians, but this is important. I think dignity is where we want to go with the autonomy of people, but also basic protection. Okay, I think that's a nice message to, to close down the, the panel. Thank you so much, everyone. I know that I asked a lot to kind of pack that into half an hour, but I thought that was a really rich and interesting discussion. Thank you for watching at home. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, please, if you want to continue the discussion, you can log on to our website, debatingeurope.eu, and you can leave kind of comments and questions that we'll put to, to, to future panels, to kind of policymakers and interviews that, that, that we run. Um, don't forget to, to like and subscribe, and hope to see you in a future panel. Thank you very much.